Section 1 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. Section 1 the viaticum after all count de Vorcy said stirring his tea with the slow movements of a prelate what truth was there in anything that was said at court almost without any restraint and did the empress whose beauty has been ruined by some secret grief who will no longer see any one and who soothes her continual mental weariness by some journeys without an object and without a rest in foggy and melancholy islands and did she really forget caesar's wife ought not even to be suspected did she really give herself to that strange and attractive corrupter ladislas Ferkoz? the bright night seemed to be scattering handfuls of stars into the placid sea which was as calm as a blue pond slumbering in the depths of a forest among the tall climbing roses which hung a mantle of yellow flowers to the fretted baluster of the terrace there stood out in the distance the illuminated fronts of the hotels and villas and occasionally women's laughter was heard above the dull monotonous sound of surf and the noise of the foghorns then captain sigmund orshaz whose sad and pensive face of a soldier who has seen too much slaughter and too many charnel houses was marked by a large scar raised his head and said in a grave haughty voice nobody has lied in accusing maria gloriosa of adultery and nobody has calumniated the empress and her minister whom god has damned in the other world ladislas Ferkoz was his sovereign's lover until he died and made his august master ridiculous and almost odious for the man no matter who he be who allows himself to be flouted by a creature who is unworthy of bearing his name and of sharing his bread who puts up with such disgrace who does not crush the guilty couple with all the weight of his power is not worth pity nor does he deserve to be spared the mockery and if i affirm that so harshly my dear count although years and years have passed since the sponge passed over that old story the reason is that i saw the last chapter of it quite in spite of myself however for i was the officer who was on duty at the palace and obliged to obey orders just as if i had been on the field of battle and on that day i was on duty near maria gloriosa madame de Lumier who had begun an animated conversation on crinolines amidst the fragrant odor of russian cigarettes and who was making fun of the striking toilettes with which she had amused herself by scanning through her opera glasses a few hours previously at the races stopped for even when she was talking most volubly she always kept her ears open to hear what was being said around her and as her curiosity was aroused she interrupted sigmund orshaz ah monsieur she said you are not going to leave our curiosity unsatisfied a story about the empress puts all our scandals on the beach and all our questions of dress into the shade and i am sure she added with a smile at the corners of her mouth that even our friend madame dormant will leave off flirting with monsieur la brassard to listen to you captain orshaz continued with his large blue eyes full of recollections it was in the middle of a grand ball that the emperor was giving on the occasion of some family anniversary though i forget exactly what and where maria gloriosa who was in great grief as she had heard that her lover was ill and his life almost despaired of far from her was going about with her face as pale as that of our lady of sorrows seemed to be a soul in affliction, appeared to be ashamed of her bare shoulders, as if she were being made a parade of in the light, while he, the adored of her heart, was lying on a bed of sickness, getting weaker every moment, longing for her, 
and perhaps calling for her in his distress. About midnight, when the violins were striking up the quadrille, which the emperor was to dance with the wife of the French ambassador, one of the ladies of honor, Countess Zegadine, went up to the empress and whispered a few words to her in a very low voice. Maria Gloriosa grew still paler, but mastered her emotion and waited until the end of the last figure. Then, however, she could not restrain herself any longer, and even without giving any pretext for running away in such a manner and leaning on the arm of her lady of honor, she made her way through the crowd as if she were in a dream and went to her own apartments. I told you that I was on duty that evening at the door of her rooms, and according to etiquette, I was going to salute her respectfully, but she did not give me time. Captain, she said excitedly and vehemently, give orders for my own private coachman, Hans Hildesheim, to get a carriage ready for me immediately. But, thinking better of it, immediately she went on. But, no, we should only lose time, and every minute is precious. Give me a cloak quickly, madame, and a lace veil. We will go out one of the small doors in the park and take the first conveyance we see. She wrapped herself in her furs, hid her face in her mantilla, and I accompanied her, without at first knowing what this mystery was, and where we were going on this mad expedition. I hailed a cab that was dawdling by the side of the pavement, and when the empress gave me the address of Ladislas Furkaz, the minister of state, in a low voice, in spite of my usual phlegm, I felt a vague shiver of emotion, one of those movements of hesitation and recoil from which the bravest are not exempt at times. But how could I get out of this unpleasant part of acting as her companion, and how show want of politeness to a sovereign who had completely lost her head? Accordingly, we started, but the Empress did not pay any more attention to me than if I had not been sitting by her side in that narrow conveyance, but stifled her sobs with her pocket handkerchief, muttered a few incoherent words, and occasionally trembled from head to foot. Her lover's name rose to her lips as if it had been a response in a litany, and I thought that she was praying to the Virgin that she might not arrive too late to see Ladislas Furkaz again in the possession of his faculties, and keep him alive for a few hours. Suddenly, as if in reply to herself, she said, I will not cry any more. He must see me looking beautiful, so that he may remember me, even in death. When we arrived, I saw that we were expected and that they had not doubted that the empress would come to close her lover's eyes with a last kiss. She left me there, and hurried to Ladislas Furkaz's room, without even shutting the doors behind her, where his beautiful sensual gypsy head stood out from the whiteness of the pillows. But his face was quite bloodless, and there was no life left in it, except in his large, strange eyes that were striated with gold like the eyes of an astrologer or of a bearded vulture. The cold numbness of the death struggle had already laid hold of his robust body and paralyzed his lips and arms, and he could not reply even by a sound of tenderness to Maria Gloriosa's wild lamentations and amorous cries. Neither reply nor smile, alas. But his eyes dilated and glistened like the last flame that shoots up from an expiring fire, and filled them with a world of dying thoughts, of divine recollections, of delirious love. They appeared to envelop her in kisses. They spoke to her. They thanked her. They followed her movements and seemed delighted at her grief. And, as if she were replying to their mute supplications, as if she had understood them, Maria Gloriosa suddenly tore off her lace, threw aside her fur cloak, stood erect beside the dying man, whose eyes were radiant, desirable in her supreme beauty, with her bare shoulders, her bust like marble, and her fair hair, in which diamonds glistened, surrounding her proud head like that of the goddess Diana, the huntress, 
and with her arms stretched out towards him in an attitude of love, of embrace and of blessing. He looked at her in ecstasy. He feasted on her beauty and seemed to be having a terrible struggle with death, in order that he might gaze at her, that apparition of love, a little longer, see her beyond eternal sleep and prolong this unexpected dream. And when he felt that it was all over with him, and that even his eyes were growing dim, two great tears rolled down his cheeks. When Maria Gloriosa saw that he was dead, she piously and devoutly kissed his lips and closed his eyes, like a priest who closes the gold tabernacle after service on an evening after benediction. And then, without exchanging a word, we returned through the darkness to the palace where the ball was still going on. There was a minute's silence, and while Madame de Lumiere, who was very much touched by this story, and whose nerves were rather highly strung, was drying her tears behind her open fan, suddenly the harsh and shrill voices of the fast women who were returning from the casino, by the strange irony of fate, struck up an idiotic song, which was then in vogue. Oh, the poor, oh, the poor, oh, the poor dear girl. End of section one. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section two of the works of Guy de Maupassant, volume three, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Relics They had given him a grand public funeral, like they do victorious soldiers who have added some dazzling pages to the glorious annals of their country, who have restored courage to desponding heads, and cast over other nations the proud shadow of their country's flag, like a yoke under which those went who were no longer to have a country or liberty. During a whole bright and calm night, when falling stars made people think of unknown metamorphoses and the transmigration of souls, who knows whether tall cavalry soldiers in their cuirasses and sitting as motionless as statues on their horses had watched by the dead man's coffin, which was resting, covered with wreaths, under the porch of the heroes, every stone of which is engraved with the name of a brave man and of a battle. The whole town was in mourning, as if it had lost the only object that had possession of its heart, and which it loved. The crowd went silently and thoughtfully down the avenue of the Champs-Élysées, and they almost fought for the commemorative medals and the common portraits which hawkers were selling, or climbed upon the stands which street boys had erected here and there, and whence they could see over the heads of the crowd. The Place de la Concorde, had something solemn about it, with its circle of statues hung from head to foot with long crepe coverings, which looked in the distance like widows, weeping and praying. According to his last wish, Jean Ramel had been conveyed to the Pantheon in the wretched pauper's hearse, which conveys them to the common grave at the shambling trot of some thin and broken-winded horse. That dreadful black conveyance without any drapery, without plumes and without flowers, which was followed by ministers and deputies, by several regiments with their bands and their flags flying above the helmets and the sabres, by children from the national schools, by delegates from the provinces, and an innumerable crowd of men in blouses, of women, of shopkeepers from every quarter, had a most theatrical effect and while standing on the steps of the Pantheon, at the foot of the massive columns of the portico, the orators successively discanted on his apotheosis, tried to make their voices predominate over the noise, emphasized their pompous periods, and finished the performance by a poor third act, which makes people yawn and gradually empties the theater. People remembered who that man had been, on whom such posthumous honors were being bestowed, and who was having such a funeral. It was Jean Ramel. 
those three sonorous syllables called up a lionine head with white hair thrown back in disorder like a mane with features that looked as if they had been cut out with a bill hook but which were so powerful and in which there lay such a flame of life that one forgot their vulgarity and ugliness with black eyes under bushy eyebrows which dilated and flashed like lightning now were veiled as if in tears and then were filled with serene mildness with a voice which now growled so as almost to terrify its hearers and which would have filled the hall of some working men's club full of the thick smoke from strong pipes without being affected by it and then would be soft coaxing persuasive and unctuous like that of a priest who is holding out promises of paradise or giving absolution for our sins he had had the good luck to be persecuted to be in the eyes of the people the incarnation of that lying formula which appears on every public edifice of those three words of the golden age which make those who think those who suffer and those who govern smile somewhat sadly liberty fraternity equality luck had been kind to him had sustained had pushed him on by the shoulders and had set him up on his pedestal again when he had fallen down like all idols do he spoke and he wrote and always in order to announce the good news to all the multitudes who suffered no matter to what grade of society they might belong to hold out his hand to them and to defend them to attack the abuses of the code that book of injustice and severity to speak the truth boldly even when it lashed his enemies as if it had been a whip his books are like gospels which are read chapter by chapter and warmed the most despairing and the most sorrowing hearts and brought comfort hope and dreams to each he had lived very modestly until the end and appeared to spend nothing and he only kept one old servant who spoke to him in the basque dialect that chaste philosopher who had all his life long feared women's snares and wiles who had looked upon love as a luxury made only for the rich and idle which unsettles the brain and interferes with acuteness of thought had allowed himself to be caught like an ordinary man late in life when his hair was white and his forehead deeply wrinkled it was not however as happens in the visions of solitary ascetics some strange queen or female magician with stars in her eyes and witchery in her voice some loose woman who held up the symbolical lamp immodestly to light up her radiant nudity and the pink and white bouquet of her sweet-smelling skin some woman in search of voluptuous pleasures whose lascivious appeals it is impossible for any man to listen to without being excited to the very depths of his being neither a princess out of some fairy tale nor a frail beauty who was an expert in the art of reviving the ardor of old men and of leading them astray nor a woman who was disgusted with her ideals that always turned out to be alike and who dreamt of awakening the heart of one of those men who suffer who have afforded so much alleviation to human misery who seem to be surrounded by a halo and who never knew anything but the true the beautiful and the good it was only a little girl of twenty who was as pretty as a wild flower who had a ringing laugh white teeth and a mind that was as spotless as a new mirror in which no figure has been reflected as yet he was in exile at the time for having given public expression to what he thought and he was living in an italian village which was buried in chestnut trees and situated on the shores of a lake that was narrow and so transparent that it might have been taken for some nobleman's fish pond that was like an emerald in a large park the village consisted of about twenty red tiled houses several paths paved with flint led up the side of the hill among the vines where the madonna full of grace and goodness extended her indulgence 
for the first time in his life ramel remarked that there were some lips that were more desirable more smiling than others that there was hair in which it must be delicious to bury the fingers like in fine silk and which it must be delightful to kiss and that there were eyes which contained an infinitude of caresses and he had spelled right through the eclogue which at length revealed true happiness to him and he had had a child a son by her this was the only secret that ramel jealously concealed and which no more than two or three of his oldest friends knew anything about and while he hesitated about spending two pence on himself and went to the institute and to the chamber of deputies outside an omnibus peppa led the happy life of a millionaire who was not frightened of the tomorrow and brought up her son like a little prince with a tutor and three servants who had nothing to do but to look after him all that ramel made went into his mistress's hands and when he felt that his last hour was approaching and that there was no hope for his recovery in full possession of his faculties and joy in his dull eyes he gave his name to peppa and made her his lawful widow in the presence of all his friends she inherited everything that her former lover left behind a considerable income from his share of the annual profits on his books and also his pension which the state continued to pay to her little ramel throve wonderfully amidst all this luxury and gave free scope to his instincts and his caprices without his mother ever having the courage to reprove him in the least and he did not bear the slightest resemblance to jean ramel full of pranks effeminate a superfine dandy and precociously vicious he suggested the idea of those pages at the court of florence whom we frequently meet with in the decameron and who were the playthings for the idle hands and tips of the patrician ladies he was very ignorant and lived at a great rate bet on races and played cards for heavy stakes with seasoned gamblers old enough to be his father and it was distressing to hear this lad joke about the memory of him whom he called the old man and persecute his mother because of the worship and adoration which she felt for jean ramel whom she spoke of as if he had become a demigod when he died like in roman theogony he would have liked altogether to have altered the arrangement of that kind of sanctuary the drawing-room where peppa kept some of her husband's manuscripts the furniture that he had most frequently used the bed on which he had died his pens his clothes his weapons and one evening not knowing how to dress himself up more originally than the rest for a masked ball that stout toinette danichef was going to give as her housewarming without saying a word to his mother he took down the academician's dress the sword and cocked hat that had belonged to jean ramel and put it on as if it had been a disguise on shrove tuesday slightly built and with thin arms and legs the wide clothes hung on him and he was a comical sight with the embroidered skirt of his coat sweeping the carpet and his sword knocking against his heels the elbows and the collar were shiny and greasy from wear for the master had worn it until it was threadbare to avoid having to buy another and had never thought of replacing it he made a tremendous hit and fair leline ablette laughed so at his grimaces and his disguise that that night she threw over prince noureddin for him although he had paid for her house her horses and everything else and allowed her six thousand francs a month two hundred forty pounds for extras and pocket money end of section two recording by james k white chula vista Section three of the works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume three, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The thief. Certainly, Doctor Sorbier exclaimed, 
who while appearing to be thinking of something else had been listening quietly to those surprising accounts of burglaries and of daring acts which might have been borrowed from the trial of cartouche certainly i do not know any viler fault nor any meaner action than to attack a girl's innocence to corrupt her to profit by a moment of unconscious weakness and of madness when her heart is beating like that of a frightened fawn when her body which has been unpolluted up till then is palpitating with mad desire and her pure lips seek those of her seducer when her whole being is feverish and vanquished and she abandons herself without thinking of the irremediable stain nor of her fall nor of the painful awakening on the morrow the man who has brought this about slowly viciously and who can tell with what science of evil and who in such a case has not steadiness and self-restraint enough to quench that flame by some icy words who has not sense enough for two who cannot recover his self-possession and master the runaway brute within him and who loses his head on the edge of the precipice over which she is going to fall is as contemptible as any man who breaks open a lock or is any rascal on the lookout for a house left defenceless and without protection or for some easy and profitable stroke of business or as that thief whose various exploits you have just related to us i for my part utterly refuse to absolve him even when extenuating circumstances plead in his favor even when he is carrying on a dangerous flirtation in which a man tries in vain to keep his balance not to exceed the limits of the game any more than at lawn tennis even when the parts are inverted and a man's adversary is some precocious curious seductive girl who shows you immediately that she has nothing to learn and nothing to experience except the last chapter of love one of those girls from whom may fate always preserve our sons and whom a psychological novel writer has christened the semi-virgins it is of course difficult and painful for that coarse and unfathomable vanity which is characteristic of every man and which might be called malism not to stir such a charming fire to act the joseph and the fool to turn away his eyes and as it were to put wax into his ears like the companions of ulysses did when they were attracted by the divine seductive songs of the sirens just to touch that pretty table covered with a perfectly new cloth at which you are invited to take a seat before any one else in such a suggestive voice and are requested to quench your thirst and to taste that new wine whose fresh and strange flavor you will never forget but who would hesitate to exercise such self-restraint if when he rapidly examined his conscience in one of those instinctive returns to his sober self in which a man thinks clearly and recovers his head if he were to measure the gravity of his fault think of his fault think of its consequences of the reprisals of the uneasiness which he would always feel in the future and which would destroy the repose and the happiness of his life you may guess that behind all these moral reflections such as a grey beard like myself may indulge in there is a story hidden and sad as it is i am sure it will interest you on account of the strange heroism that it shows he was silent for a few moments as if to classify recollections and with his elbows resting on the arms of his easy chair and his eyes looking into space he continued in the slow voice of a hospital professor who is explaining a case to his class of medical students at a bedside he was one of those men who as our grandfathers used to say never met with a cruel woman the type of the adventurous knight who was always foraging who had something of the scamp about him but who despised danger and was bold even to rashness he was ardent in the pursuit of pleasure and a man who had an irresistible charm about him one of those men in whom we excuse the greatest excesses as the most natural things in the world he had run through all his money at gambling and with pretty girls and so became as it were a soldier of fortune who amused himself whenever and however he could and was at that time quartered at versailles i knew him to the very depths of his childish heart which was only too easily penetrated and sounded 
and i loved him like some old bachelor uncle loves a nephew who plays him some tricks but who knows how to make him indulgent towards him and how to wheedle him he had made me his confidant far more than his adviser kept me informed of his slightest tricks though he always pretended to be speaking about one of his friends and not about himself and i must confess that his youthful impetuosity his careless gaiety and his amorous ardor sometimes distracted my thoughts and made me envy the handsome vigorous young fellow who was so happy at being alive so that i had not the courage to check him to show him his right road and to call out to him take care as children do at blind man's bluff and one day after one of those interminable cotillions where the couples do not leave each other for hours but have the bridle on their neck and can disappear together without anybody thinking of taking notice of it the poor fellow at last discovered what love was that real love which takes up its abode in the very centre of the heart and in the brain and is proud of being there and which rules like a sovereign and tyrannous master and so he grew desperately enamoured of a pretty but badly brought up girl who was as disquieting and as wayward as she was pretty she loved him however or rather she idolized him despotically madly with all her enraptured soul and all her excited person left to do as she pleased by imprudent and frivolous parents suffering from neurosis in consequence of the unwholesome friendships which she contracted at the convent school instructed by what she saw and heard and knew was going on around her in spite of her deceitful and artificial conduct knowing that neither her father nor her mother who were very proud of their race as well as avaricious would ever agree to let her marry the man whom she had taken a liking to that handsome fellow who had little besides visionary ideas and debts and who belonged to the middle classes she laid aside all scruples thought of nothing but of belonging to him altogether of taking him for her lover and of triumphing over his desperate resistance as an honorable man by degrees the unfortunate man's strength gave way his heart grew softened his nerves became excited and he allowed himself to be carried away by that current which buffeted him surrounded him and left him on the shore like a waif and a stray they wrote letters full of temptation and of madness to each other and not a day passed without their meeting either accidentally as it seemed or at parties and balls she had given him her lips in long ardent caresses and she had sealed their compact of mutual passion with kisses of desire and of hope and at last she brought him to her room almost in spite of himself the doctor stopped and his eyes suddenly filled with tears as these former troubles came back to his mind and then in a hoarse voice he went on full of horror of what he was going to relate for months he scaled the garden wall and holding his breath and listening for the slightest noise like a burglar who was going to break into a house he went in by the servant's entrance which she had left open went barefoot down a long passage and up the broad staircase which creaked occasionally to the second story where his mistress's room was and stopped there nearly the whole night one night when it was darker than usual and he was making haste lest he should be later than the time agreed on the officer knocked up against a piece of furniture in the anteroom and upset it it so happened that the girl's mother had not gone to sleep yet either because she had a sick headache or else because she had sat up late over some novel and frightened at that unusual noise which disturbed the silence of the house she jumped out of bed opened the door saw someone indistinctly running away and keeping close to the wall and immediately thinking that there were burglars in the house she aroused her husband and the servants by her frantic screams the unfortunate man knew what he was about and seeing into what a terrible fix he had got and preferring to be taken for a common thief to dishonoring his adored mistress and to betraying the secret of their guilty love he ran into the drawing-room felt on the tables and whatnots filled his pockets at random with valuable gewgaws and then cowered down behind the grand piano which barred up a corner of a large room 
the servants who had run in with lighted candles found him and overwhelming him with abuse seized him by the collar and dragged him panting and appearing half dead with shame and terror to the nearest police station he defended himself with intentional awkwardness when he was brought up for trial kept up his part with the most perfect self-possession and without any signs of the despair and anguish that he felt in his heart and condemned and degraded and made to suffer martyrdom in his honor as a man and as a soldier he did not protest but went to prison as one of those criminals whom society gets rid of like noxious vermin he died there of misery and of bitterness of spirit with the name of the fair-haired idol for whom he had sacrificed himself on his lips as if it had been an ecstatic prayer and he entrusted his will to the priest who administered extreme unction to him and requested him to give it to me in it without mentioning anybody and without in the least lifting the veil he at last explained the enigma and cleared himself of those accusations the terrible burden of which he had borne until his last breath i have always thought myself though i do not know why that the girl married and had several charming children whom she brought up with the austere strictness and in the serious piety of former days end of section three Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 4 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Rupture It is just as I tell you, my dear fellow those two poor things whom we all of us envied who look like a couple of pigeons when they are billing and cooing and were always spooning until they made themselves ridiculous now hate each other just as much as they used to adore each other it is a complete break and one of those which cannot be mended like you can an old plate and all for a bit of nonsense for something so funny that it ought to have brought them closer together and have made them amuse themselves together until they were ill but how can a man explain himself when he is dying of jealousy and when he keeps repeating to his terrified mistress you are lying you are lying when he shakes her interrupts her while she is speaking and says such hard things to her that at last she flies into a rage has enough of it becomes hard and mad and thinks of nothing but of giving him tit for tat and of paying him out in his own coin does not care a straw about destroying his happiness sends everything to the devil and talks a lot of bosh which she certainly does not believe and then because there is nothing so stupid and so obstinate in the whole world as lovers neither he nor she will take the first steps and own to having been in the wrong and regret having gone too far but both wait and watch and do not even write a few lines about nothing which would restore peace no they let day succeed day and there are feverish and sleepless nights when the bed seems so hard so cheerless and so large and habits get weakened and the fire of love that was still smouldering at the bottom of the heart evaporates in smoke by degrees both find some reason for what they wish to do they think themselves idiots to lose the time which will never return in that fashion and so good-bye and there you are that is how josine cadenetti and that great idiot servants separated lali spring had lighted a cigarette and the blue smoke played about her fine fair hair and made one think of those last rays of the setting sun which pierced through the clouds at sunset and resting her elbows on her knees and with her chin in her hand in a dreamy attitude she murmured sad isn't it ah i replied at their age people easily console themselves and everything begins over again even love well josine had already found somebody else and did she tell you her story of course she did and it is such a joke you must know that servants is one of those fellows like one would wish to have when one has time to amuse oneself and so self-possessed that he would be capable of ruining all the older ones in a girl's school 
and given to trifling as much as most men, so that Josine calls him perpetual motion. He would have liked to have gone on with his fun until the day of judgment, and seemed to fancy that beds were not made to sleep in at all. But she could not get used to being deprived of nearly all her rest, and it really made her ill. But as she wished to be as conciliatory as possible, and to love and to be loved as ardently as in the past, and also to sleep off the effects of her happiness peacefully, she rented a small room in a distant quarter, in a quiet, shady street, giving out that she had just come from the country, and put hardly any furniture into it except a good bed and a dressing table. Then she invented an old aunt for the occasion, who was ill and always grumbling, and who suffered from heart disease and lived in one of the suburbs. And so, several times a week, Josine took refuge in her sleeping place, and used to sleep late there as if it had been some delicious abode where one forgets the whole world. Sometimes they forgot to call her at the proper time. She got back late, tired, with red and swollen eyelids, involved herself in lies, contradicted herself, and looked so much as if she had just come from the confessional, feeling horribly ashamed of herself, or as if she had hurried home from some assignation, that at last Servants worried himself about it, thought that he was being made a fool of, like so many of his comrades were, got into a rage, and made up his mind to set the matter straight, and so discover who this aunt of his mistresses was, who had so suddenly fallen from the skies. He necessarily applied to an obliging agency where they excited his jealousy, exasperated him day after day by making him believe that Josine Catanetti was making an absolute fool of him, had no more a sick aunt than she had any virtue, but that during the day she continued the little debaucheries which she committed with him at night, and that she shamelessly frequented some discreet bachelor's lodgings where more than probably one of his own best friends was amusing himself at his expense and having his share of the cake he was fool enough to believe these fellows instead of going and watching josine himself putting his nose into the business and going and knocking at the door of her room he wanted to hear no more and would not listen to her for a trifle in spite of her tears he would have turned the poor thing into the streets as if she had been a bundle of dirty linen you may guess how she flew out at him and told him all sorts of things to annoy him she let him believe he was not mistaken that she had had enough of his affection and that she was madly in love with another man he grew very pale when she said that looked at her furiously clenched his teeth and said in a hoarse voice tell me his name tell me his name oh she said chaffingly you know him very well and if i had not happened to have gone in i think there would have been a tragedy how stupid they are and they were so happy and loved each other so and now josine is living with fat schweinshun a low scoundrel who will live upon her and servantes is taken up with sophie labisque who might easily be his mother you know her, that bundle of red and yellow, who has been at this kind of thing for eighteen years, and whom La Glandy has christened Secula Seculorum. By Jove, I should rather think I did. End of section four. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section five of the works of Guy de Maupassant. Volume Three, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A useful house. Royamount's fat sides shook with laughter at the mere recollection of the funny story that he had promised to his friends, and throwing himself back in the great armchair which he completely filled that picker-up of bits of pinchbeck as they called him at the club at last said it is perfectly true bordenave does not owe anyone a penny and can go through any street he likes and publish those famous memoirs of sheriff's officers which he has been writing for the last ten years when he did not dare to go out and in which he carefully brought out the characters and peculiarities of all those generous distributors of stamped paper with whom he had had dealings, their tricks and wiles, their weaknesses, their jokes, their manner of performing their duties, sometimes with brutal rudeness, 
and at others with cunning good nature now embarrassed and almost ashamed of their work and again ironically jovial as well the artifices of their clerks to get a few crumbs from their employer's cake the book will soon be published and macon the vaudeville writer has promised him a preface so that it will be a most amusing work you are surprised eh confess that you are absolutely surprised and i will lay you any bet you like that you will not guess how our excellent friend whose existence is an inexplicable problem has been able to settle with his creditors and suddenly produce the requisite amount do get to the facts confound it captain hardier said who was growing tired of all this verbiage all right i will get to them as quickly as possible royamount replied throwing the stump of his cigar into the fire i will clear my throat and begin i suppose all of you know that two better friends than bordenave and quillanet do not exist neither of them could do without the other and they have ended by dressing alike by having the same gestures the same laugh the same walk and the same inflections of voice so that one would think that some close bond united them and that they had been brought up together from childhood there is however this great difference between them that bordenave is completely ruined and that all that he possesses are bundles of mortgages laughable parchments which attest his ancient race and chimerical hopes of inheriting money some day though these expectations are already heavily hypothecated consequently he is always on the lookout for some fresh expedients for raising money though he is superbly indifferent about everything while sebastian quillanet of the banking-house of quillanet brothers must have an income of eight thousand francs a year but is descended from an obscure laborer who managed to secure some of the national property then he became an army contractor speculated on defeat as well as victory and does not know now what to do with his money but the millionaire is timid dull and always bored the ruined spendthrift amuses him by his impertinent ways and his libertine jokes he prompts him when he is at a loss for an answer extricates him out of his difficulties serves as his guide in the great forests of paris which is strewn with so many pitfalls and helps him to avoid those vulgar adventures which socially ruins a man no matter how well ballasted he may be then he points out to him what women would make suitable mistresses for him who make a man noted and have the effect of some rare and beautiful flower pinned into his buttonhole he is the confidant of his intrigues his guest when he gives small special entertainments his daily familiar table companion and the buffoon whose sly humor one stimulates and whose worst witticisms one tolerates really really the captain interrupted him you have been going on for more than a quarter of an hour without saying anything so royamont shrugged his shoulders and continued oh you can be very tiresome when you please my dear fellow last year when he was at daggers drawn with his people who were deafening him with their recriminations were worrying him and threatening him with a lot of annoyance quillanet got married a marriage of reason and which apparently changed his habits and his tastes more especially as the banker was at that time keeping a perfect little marvel of a woman a parisian jewel of unspeakable attractions and of bewitching delicacy that adorable suzette marley who is just like a pocket venus and who in some prior stage of her existence must have been phryne or lesbia of course he did not get rid of her but as he was bound to take some judicious precautions which are necessary for a man who is deceiving his wife he rented a furnished house with a courtyard in front and a garden at the back which one might think had been built to shelter some amorous folly it was the nest that he had dreamt of warm snug elegant the walls covered with silk hangings of subdued tints large pier glasses allegorical pictures and filled with luxurious low furniture that seemed to invite caresses and embraces bordenave occupied the ground floor 
and the first floor served as a shrine for the banker and his mistress. Well, just a week ago, in order to hide the situation better, Bordenave asked Quillinet and some other friends to one of those luncheons, which he understands so well how to order. Such a delicious luncheon, that before it was quite over, every man had a woman on his knees already, and was asking himself whether a kiss from coaxing and naughty lips was not a thousand times more intoxicating than the finest old brandy or the choicest vintage wines, and was looking at the bedroom door wishing to escape to it, although the faculty altogether forbids that fashion of digesting a dainty repast, when the butler came in with an embarrassed look and whispered something to him. Tell the gentleman that he has made a mistake, and ask him to leave me in peace, Bordenave replied to him in an angry voice. The servant went out and returned immediately to say that the intruder was using threats, that he refused to leave the house, and even spoke of having recourse to the commissary of police. Bordenave frowned, threw his table napkin down, upset two glasses, and staggered out with a red face, swearing and stammering out, this is rather too much, and the fellow shall find out what going out of the window means, if he will not leave by the door. But in the ante-room he found himself face to face with a very cool, polite, impassive gentleman, who said very quietly to him, You are Count Robert de Bordenave, I believe, monsieur? Yes, monsieur. And the lease that you signed at the lawyer's, monsieur Albin Calvert, in the Rue du Faubert Poisonnier? is in your name i believe certainly monsieur then i regret extremely to have to tell you that if you are not in the position to pay the various accounts which different people have entrusted to me for collection here i shall be obliged to seize all the furniture pictures plate clothes etc which are here in the presence of two witnesses who are waiting for me downstairs in the street i suppose this is some joke monsieur it would be a very poor joke, Monsieur le Comte, and one which I should certainly not allow myself towards you. The situation was absolutely critical and ridiculous, the more so that in the dining room the women who were slightly elevated were tapping the wine glasses with their spoons and calling for him. What could he do except to explain his misadventure to Quillinet, who became sobered immediately, and rather than see his shrine of love violated, his secret sin disclosed, and his pictures, ornaments, and furniture sold, gave a check in due form for the claim there and then, though with a very wry face. And in spite of this, some people will deny that men who are utterly cleared out often have a stroke of luck. End of Section 5 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 6 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Accent It was a large upholstered house, with long white terraces shaded by vines, from which one could see the sea large pines stretched a dark dome over the sacked facade and there was a look of neglect of want and wretchedness about it all such as irreparable losses departures to other countries and death leave behind them the interior wore a strange look with half unpacked boxes serving for wardrobes piles of bandboxes and for seats there was an array of worm-eaten armchairs, into which bits of velvet and silk, which had been cut from old dresses, had been festooned anyhow, and along the walls there were rows of rusty nails which made one think of old portraits and of pictures full of associations which had one by one been bought for a low price by some second-hand furniture broker. The rooms were in disorder and furnished no matter how, while velvets were hanging from the ceilings and in the corners, and seemed to show that as the servants were no longer paid except by hopes, they no longer did more than give them an accidental, careless touch with the broom occasionally. The drawing-room, which was extremely large, was full of useless knick-knacks, rubbish which is put up for sale at stalls at watering-places, daubs, 
they could not be called paintings of portraits and of flowers and an old piano with yellow keys such is the home where she who had been called the handsome madame de mauriac was spending her monotonous existence like some unfortunate doll which inconstant childish hands have thrown into a corner in a loft she who almost passed for a professional seductress and whose coquetries at least so the faithful ones of the party said had been able to excite a passing and last spark of desire in the dull eyes of the emperor like so many others she and her husband had waited for his return from elba had discounted a fresh immediate chance had kept up boldly and spent the remains of his fortune at that game of luxury on the day when the illusion vanished and he was forced to awake from his dream monsieur de mauriac without considering that he was leaving his wife and daughter behind him almost penniless but not being able to make up his mind to come down in the world to vegetate to fight against his creditors to accept the derisive alms of some cynosure poisoned himself like a shop-girl who was forsaken by her lover madame de mauriac did not mourn for him and as this lamentable disaster had made her interesting and as she was assisted and supported by unexpected acts of kindness and had a good adviser in one of those old parisian lawyers who would get anybody out of the most inextricable difficulties she managed to save something from the wreck and to keep a small income then reassured and emboldened and resting her ultimate illusions and her chimerical hopes on her daughter's radiant beauty and preparing for that last game in which they would risk everything and perhaps also hoping that she might herself marry again the ancient flirt arranged a double existence for months and months she disappeared from the world and as a pretext for her isolation and for hiding herself in the country she alleged her daughter's delicate health and also the important interests she had to look after in the south of france her frivolous friends looked upon that as a great act of heroism as something almost superhuman and so courageous that they tried to distract her by their incessant letters religiously kept her up in all the scandal and love adventures in the falls as well as in the apotheosis of the capital the difficult struggle which madame de mauriac had to keep up in order to maintain her rank was really as fine as any of those campaigns in the twilight of glory as those slow retreats where men only give way inch by inch and fight until the last cartridge is expended until at last fresh troops arrive reinforcement which bar the way to the enemy and save the threatened flag broken in by the same discipline and haunted by the same dream mother and daughter lived on almost nothing in the dull dilapidated house which the peasants called the chateau and economized like poor people who only have a few hundred francs a year to live on but fabian de mauriac developed well in spite of everything and grew up into a woman like some rare flower which is preserved from all contact with the outer air and is reared in a hothouse in order that she might not lose her parisian accent by speaking too much with the servants who had remained peasants under their livery madame de mauriac who had not been able to bring a lady's maid with her on account of the extra cost which her travelling expenses and wages would have entailed and who moreover was afraid that some indiscretion might betray her manoeuvres and cover her with ridicule made up her mind to wait on her daughter herself and fabian talked with nobody but her saw nobody but her and was like a little novice in a convent nobody was allowed to speak to her or to interfere with her walks in the large garden or on the white terraces that were reflected in the blue water as soon as the season for the country and the seaside came however they packed up their trunks and locked the doors of their house of exile as they were not known and taking those terrible trains which stop at every station and by which travellers arrive at their destination in the middle of the night with the certainty that nobody will be waiting for you and see you get out of the carriage they travelled third class so that they might have a few banknotes the more with which to make a show a fortnight in paris in the family house at auteuil a fortnight in which to try on dresses and bonnets and to show themselves and then trouville x or beatrice the whole show complete 
with parties succeeding parties money was spent as if they did not know its value balls at the casinos constant flirtations compromising intimacies and those kind of admirers who immediately surround two pretty women one in the radiant beauty of her eighteen years and the other in the brightness of that maturity which beautiful september days bring with them unfortunately however they had to do the same thing over again every year and as if bad luck were continuing to follow them implacably madame de mauriac and her daughter did not succeed in their endeavors and did not manage during her usual absence from home to pick up some nice fellow who fell in love immediately who took them seriously and asked for fabian's hand consequently they were very unhappy their energies flagged and their courage left them like water that escapes drop by drop through a crack in a jug they grew low-spirited and no longer dared to be open towards each other and to exchange confidences and projects fabian with her pale cheeks her large eyes with blue circles round them and her tight lips looked like some captive princess who is tormented by constant ennui and troubled by evil suggestions who dreams of flight and of escape from that prison where fate holds her captive one night when the sky was covered with heavy thunder clouds and the heat was most oppressive madame de mauriac called her daughter whose room was next to hers after calling her loudly for some time in vain she sprang out of bed in terror and almost broke open the door with her trembling hands the room was empty and the pillows untouched then nearly mad and foreseeing some irreparable misfortune the poor woman ran all over the large house and then rushed out into the garden where the air was heavy with the scent of flowers she had the appearance of some wild animal that is being pursued by a pack of hounds tried to penetrate the darkness with her anxious looks and gasped as if someone were holding her by the throat but suddenly she staggered uttered a painful cry and fell down in a fit there before her in the shadow of the myrtle trees fabian was sitting on the knees of a man of the gardener with both her arms round his neck and kissing him ardently and as if to defy her and to show her how vain all her precautions and her vigilance had been the girl was telling her lover in the country dialect and in a cooing and delightful voice how she adored him and that she belonged to him madame de mauriac is in a lunatic asylum and fabian has married the gardener what could she have done better end of section six recording by james k white chula vista section seven of the works of guy de maupassant volume three by guy de maupassant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by james k white chula vista ghosts just at the time when the concordat was in its most flourishing condition a young man belonging to a wealthy and highly respected middle-class family went to the office of the head of the police at blank and begged for his help and advice which was immediately promised him my father threatens to disinherit me the young man then began although i have never offended against the laws of the state of morality or of his paternal authority merely because i do not share his blind reverence for the catholic church and her ministers on that account he looks upon me not merely as latitudinarian but as a perfect atheist and a faithful old manservant of ours who is much attached to me and who accidentally saw my father's will told me in confidence that he had left all his property to the jesuits i think this is highly suspicious and i fear that the priests have been maligning me to my father until less than a year ago we used to live very quietly and happily together but ever since he had had so much to do with the clergy our domestic peace and happiness are at an end what you have told me the official replied is as likely as it is regrettable but i fail to see how i can interfere in the matter your father is in the full possession of all his mental faculties 
and can dispose of all his property exactly as he pleases i also think that your protest is premature you must wait until this will can legally take effect and then you can invoke the aid of justice i am sorry to say that i can do nothing for you i think you will be able to the young man replied for i believe that a very clever piece of deceit is being carried on here how please explain yourself more clearly when i remonstrated with him yesterday evening he referred to my dead mother and at last assured me in a voice of the deepest conviction that she had frequently appeared to him and had threatened him with all the torments of the damned if he did not disinherit his son who had fallen away from god and leave all his property to the church now i do not believe in ghosts neither do i the police director replied but i cannot well do anything on this dangerous ground if i had nothing but superstitions to go upon you know how the church rules all our affairs since the concordat with rome and if i investigate this matter and obtain no results i am risking my post it would be very different if you could adduce any proofs for your suspicions i do not deny that i should like to see the clerical party which will i fear be the ruin of austria receive a staggering blow try therefore to get to the bottom of this business and then we will talk it over again about a month passed without the young latitudinarian being heard of but then he suddenly came one evening evidently in a great state of excitement and told him that he was in a position to expose the priestly deceit which he had mentioned if the authorities would assist him the police director asked for further information i have obtained a number of important clues the young man said in the first place my father confessed to me that my mother did not appear to him in our house but in the churchyard where she is buried my mother was consumptive for many years and a few weeks before her death she went to the village of blank where she died and was buried in addition to this i found out from our footman that my father has already left the house twice late at night in company of x the jesuit priest and that on both occasions he did not return till morning each time he was remarkably uneasy and low-spirited after his return and had three masses said for my dead mother he also told me just now that he has to leave home this evening on business but immediately he told me that our footman saw the jesuit go out of the house we may therefore assume that he intends this evening to consult the spirit of my dead mother again and this would be an excellent opportunity for getting on the track of the matter if you do not object to opposing the most powerful force in the empire for the sake of such an insignificant individual as myself every citizen has an equal right to the protection of the state the police director replied and i think that i have shown often enough that i am not wanting in courage to perform my duty no matter how serious the consequences may be but only very young men act without any prospects of success as they are carried away by their feelings when you came to me the first time i was obliged to refuse your request for assistance but today your shares have risen in value it is now eight o'clock and i shall expect you in two hours time here in my office at present all you have to do is to hold your tongue everything else is my affair as soon as it was dark four men got into a closed carriage in the yard of the police office and were driven in the direction of the village of blank their carriage however did not enter the village but stopped at the edge of a small wood in the immediate neighborhood here they all four alighted they were the police director accompanied by the young latitudinarian a police sergeant and an ordinary policeman who was however dressed in plain clothes the first thing for us to do is to examine the locality carefully the police director said it is eleven o'clock and the exercisers of ghosts will not arrive before midnight so we have time to look round us and to take our measure 
the four men went to the churchyard which lay at the end of the village near the little wood everything was still as death and not a soul was to be seen the sexton was evidently sitting in the public house for they found the door of his cottage locked as well as the door of the little chapel that stood in the middle of the churchyard where is your mother's grave the police director asked but as there were only a few stars visible it was not easy to find but at last they managed it and the police director looked about in the neighborhood of it the position is not a very favorable one for us he said at last there is nothing here not even a shrub behind which we could hide but just then the policeman said that he had tried to get into the sexton's hut through the door or the window and that at last he had succeeded in doing so by breaking open a square in a window which had been mended with paper and that he had opened it and obtained possession of the key which he brought to the police director his plans were very quickly settled he had the chapel opened and went in with the young latitudinarian then he told the police sergeant to lock the door behind him and to put the key back where he had found it and to shut the window of the sexton's cottage carefully lastly he made arrangements as to what they were to do in case anything unforeseen should occur whereupon the sergeant and the constable left the churchyard and lay down in a ditch at some distance from the gate but opposite to it almost as soon as the clock struck half past eleven they heard steps near the chapel whereupon the police director and the young latitudinarian went to the window in order to watch the beginning of the exorcism and as the chapel was in total darkness they thought that they should be able to see without being seen but matters turned out differently from what they expected suddenly the key turned in the lock and they barely had time to conceal themselves behind the altar before two men came in one of whom was carrying a dark lantern one was the young man's father an elderly man of the middle class who seemed very unhappy and depressed the other the jesuit father blank a tall thin big-boned man with a thin bilious face in which two large gray eyes shone restlessly under their bushy black eyebrows he lit the tapers which were standing on the altar and then began to say a requiem mass while the old man knelt on the altar steps and served him when it was over the jesuit took the book of the gospels and the holy water sprinkler and went slowly out of the chapel while the old man followed him with the holy water basin in one hand and a taper in the other then the police director left his hiding place and stooping down so as not to be seen he crept to the chapel window where he cowered down carefully and the young man followed his example they were now looking straight on his mother's grave the jesuit followed by the superstitious old man walked three times round the grave then he remained standing before it and by the light of the taper he read a few passages from the gospel then he dipped the holy water sprinkler three times into the holy water basin and sprinkled the grave three times then both returned to the chapel knelt down outside it with their faces towards the grave and began to pray aloud until at last the jesuit sprang up in a species of wild ecstasy and cried out three times in a shrill voice exurge 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 scarcely had the last word of the exorcism died away when thick blue smoke rose out of the grave which rapidly grew into a cloud and began to assume the outlines of a human body until at last a tall white figure stood behind the grave and beckoned with its hand who art thou the jesuit asked solemnly while the old man began to cry when i was alive i was called anna maria blank the ghost replied in a hollow voice will you answer all my questions the priest continued as far as i can have you not yet been delivered from purgatory by our prayers and all the masses for your soul which we have said for you not yet but soon soon i shall be when 
as soon as that blasphemer my son has been punished has that not already happened has not your husband disinherited his lost son and made the church his heir in his place that is not enough what must he do besides he must deposit his will with the judicial authorities as his last will and testament and drive the reprobate out of his house consider well what you are saying must this really be it must or otherwise i shall have to languish in purgatory much longer the sepulchral voice replied with a deep sigh but the next moment it yelled out in terror oh good lord and the ghost began to run away as fast as it could a shrill whistle was heard and then another and the police director laid his hand on the shoulder of the exerciser accompanied with the remark you are in custody meanwhile the police sergeant and the policeman who had come into the churchyard had caught the ghost and dragged it forward it was the sexton who had put on a flowing white dress and who wore a wax mask which bore striking resemblance to his mother as the son declared when the case was heard it was proved that the mask had been very skillfully made from a portrait of the deceased woman the government gave orders that the matter should be investigated as secretly as possible and left the punishment of father blank to the spiritual authorities which was a matter of course at a time when priests were outside the jurisdiction of the civil authorities and it is needless to say that he was very comfortable during his imprisonment in a monastery in a part of the country which abounded with game and trout the only valuable result of the amusing ghost story was that it brought about a reconciliation between father and son and the former as a matter of fact felt such deep respect for priests and their ghosts in consequence of the apparition that a short time after his wife had left purgatory for the last time in order to talk with him he turned protestant end of section seven recording by james k white chula vista section eight of the works of guy de maupassant volume three by guy de maupassant this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Crash. Love is longer than death, and consequently also than the greatest crash. A young and by no means bad-looking son of Palestine, and one of the barons of the almanac of the ghetto who had left the field covered with wounds in the last general engagement on the stock exchange, used to go very frequently to the Universal Exhibition in Vienna in 1873 in order to divert his thoughts and to console himself amidst the varied scenes and the numerous objects of attraction there one day he met a newly married couple in the russian section who had a very old coat of arms but on the other hand a very modest income the latter circumstance had frequently emboldened the stockbroker to make secret overtures to the delightful little lady overtures which might have fascinated certain viennese actresses but which were sure to insult a respectable woman the baroness whose name appeared in the almanac de gotha therefore felt something very like hatred for the man from the ghetto and for a long time her pretty little head had been full of various plans of revenge the stockbroker who was really and even passionately in love with her got close to her in the exhibition buildings which he could do all the more easily since the little woman's husband had taken to flight foreseeing mischief as soon as she went up to the showcase of a russian fur dealer before which she remained standing in rapture do look at that lovely fur the baroness said while her dark eyes expressed her pleasure i must have it but she looked at the white ticket on which the price was marked four thousand roubles she said in despair that is about six thousand florins certainly he replied but what of that 
it is a sum not worth mentioning in the presence of such a charming lady but my husband is not in a position be less cruel than usual for once the man from the ghetto said to the young woman in a low voice and allow me to lay this sable skin at your feet i presume that you are joking not i i think you must be joking as i cannot think that you intend to insult me but baroness i love you that is one reason more why you should not make me angry but oh i am in such a rage the energetic little woman said i could flog you like venus in the fur did her slave let me be your slave the stock exchange baron replied ardently and i will gladly put up everything from you really in this sable cloak and with a whip in your hand you would make a most lovely picture of the heroine of that story the baroness looked at the man for a moment with a peculiar smile then if i were to listen to you favorably you would let me flog you she said after a pause with pleasure very well she replied quickly you will let me give you twenty-five cuts with a whip and i will be yours after the twenty-fifth blow are you in earnest fully the man from the ghetto took her hand and pressed it ardently to his lips when may i come tomorrow evening at eight o'clock and i may bring the sable cloak and the whip with me no i will see about that myself the next evening the enamoured stockbroker came to the house of the charming little baroness and found her alone lying on a couch wrapped in a dark fur while she held a dog whip in her small hand which the man from the ghetto kissed you know our agreement she began of course i do the stock exchange baron replied i am to allow you to give me twenty-five cuts with the whip and after the twenty-fifth you will listen to me yes but i'm going to tie your hands first of all the amorous baron quietly allowed this new delilah to tie his hands behind him and then at her bidding he knelt down before her and she raised her whip and hit him hard oh that hurts me most confoundedly he exclaimed i mean it to hurt you she said with a mocking laugh and went on thrashing him without mercy at last the poor fool groaned with pain but he consoled himself with the thought that each blow brought him nearer to his happiness at the twenty-fourth cut she threw the whip down that only makes twenty-four the beaten would-be don juan remarked i will make you a present of the twenty-fifth she said with a laugh and now you are mine altogether mine he exclaimed ardently what are you thinking of have i not let you beat me certainly but i promised you to grant your wish after the twenty-fifth blow and you have only received twenty-four the cruel little bit of virtue cried and i have witnesses to prove it with these words she drew back the curtains over the door and her husband followed by two other gentlemen came out of the next room smiling for a moment the stockbroker remained speechless on his knees before the beautiful woman then he gave a deep sigh and sadly uttered that one most significant word crash end of section eight recording by james k white chula vista section two of the works of guy de maupassant volume three by guy de maupassant this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. An Honest Ideal Among my numerous friends in Vienna, there is one who is an author, and who has always amused me by his childish idealism. Not by his idealism from an abstract point of view, for in spite of my pessimism, I am an absurd idealist, and because I am perfectly well aware of this, i as a rule never laugh at people's idealism but his sort of idealism was really too funny he was a serious man of great capabilities who only just fell short of being learned 
with a clear critical intellect a man without any illusions about society the state literature or anything else and especially not about women but yet he was the craziest optimist as soon as he got upon the subject of actresses theatrical princesses and heroines he was one of those men who like hacklander cannot discover the ideal of virtue anywhere except in a ballet girl my friend was always in love with some actress or other of course only platonically and from preference with some girl of rising talent whose literary knight he constituted himself until the time came when her admirers laid something much more substantial than laurel wreaths at her feet then he withdrew and sought for fresh talent which would allow itself to be patronized by him he was never without the photograph of his ideal in his breast pocket and when he was in a good temper he used to show me one or the other of them whom i had never seen with a knowing smile and once when we were sitting in a cafe in the prater he took out a portrait without saying a word and laid it on the table before me it was the portrait of a beautiful woman but what struck me in it first of all was not the almost classic cut of her features but her white eyes if she had not the black hair of a living woman i should take her for a statue i said certainly my friend replied for a statue of venus perhaps for the venus of milo herself who is she a young actress that is a matter of course in your case what i meant was what is her name my friend told me and it was a name which is at present one of the best known on the german stage with which a number of terrestrial adventures are connected as every viennese knows with which those of venus herself were only innocent toying but which i then heard for the first time my idealist described her as a woman of the highest talent which i believed and as an angel of purity which i did not believe on that particular occasion however i at any rate did not believe the contrary a few days later i was accidentally turning over the leaves of the portrait album of another intimate friend of mine who was a thoroughly careless somewhat dissolute viennese and i came across that strange female face with the dead eyes again how did you come by the picture of this venus i asked him well she certainly is a venus he replied but one of that cheap kind who are to be met with in the graben which is their ideal grove impossible i give you my word of honor it is so i could say nothing more after that so my intellectual friend's new ideal that woman of the highest dramatic talent that wonderful woman with the white eyes was a street venus but my friend was right in one respect he had not deceived himself with regard to her wonderful dramatic gifts and she very soon made a career for herself far from being a mute character on a suburban stage she rose in two years to be the leading actress at one of the principal theatres my friend interested himself on her behalf with the manager of it who was not blinded by any prejudices she acted in a rehearsal and pleased him whereupon he sent her to star in the provinces and my friend accompanied her and took care she was well puffed she went on the boards at schiller's marie stuart and achieved the most brilliant success and before she had finished her starring tour she obtained an engagement at a large theatre in a northern town where her appearance was the signal for a triumphant success her reputation that is her reputation as a most gifted actress grew very high in less than a year and the manager of the court theatre invited her to star at the court theatre she was received with some suspicion at first but she soon overcame all prejudices and doubts the applause grew more and more vehement at every act and at the close of the performance her future was decided she obtained a splendid engagement and soon afterwards became an actress at the court theatre a well-known author wrote a racy novel of which she was the heroine 
one of the leading bankers and financiers was at her feet she was the most popular personage and the lioness of the capital she had splendid apartments and all her surroundings were of the most luxurious character and she had reached that height in her career at which my idealistic friend who had constituted himself her literary knight quietly took his leave of her and went in search of fresh talent but the beautiful woman with the dead eyes and the dead heart seemed to be destined to be the scourge of the idealists quite against her will for scarcely had one unfolded his wings and flown away from her than another fell out of the nest into her net a very young student who was neither handsome nor of good family and certainly not rich or even well off but who was enthusiastic intellectual and impressionable saw her as marie stuart in the maid of orleans the lady with the camellias and most of the plays of the best french playwriters for the manager was making experiments with her and she was doing the same with her talents the poor student was enraptured with the celebrated actress and at the same time conceived a passion for the woman which bordered on madness he saved up penny by penny he nearly starved himself only in order that he might be able to pay for a seat in the gallery whenever she acted and be able to devour her with his eyes he always got a seat in the front row for he was always outside three hours before the doors opened so as to be one of the first to gain his olympus the seat of the theatrical enthusiasts he grew pale and his heart beat violently when she appeared he laughed when she laughed shed tears when she wept applauded her as if he had been paid to do it by the highest favors that a woman can bestow and yet she did not know him and was ignorant of his very existence the regular frequenters of the court theater noticed him at last and spoke about his infatuation for her until at last she heard about him but still did not know him and although he could not send her any costly jewelry and not even a bouquet yet at last he succeeded in attracting her attention when she had been acting and the theatre had been empty for a long time and she left it wrapped in valuable furs and got into the carriage of her banker which was waiting for her at the stage door he always stood there often up to his ankles in snow or in the pouring rain at first she did not notice him but when her maid said something to her in a whisper on one occasion she looked round in surprise and he got a look from those large eyes which were not dead then but dark and bright a look which recompensed him for all his sufferings and filled him with proud hopes which constantly gained more power over the young idealist who was usually so modest at last there was a thorough silent understanding between the theatrical princess and the dumb adorer when she put her foot on the carriage step she looked round at him and every time he stood there devouring her with his eyes she saw it and got contentedly into her carriage but she did not see how he ran after the carriage and how he reached her house panting for breath when she did nor how he lay down outside after the door had closed behind her one stormy summer night when the wind was howling in the chimneys and the rain was beating against the windows and on the pavement the poor student was again lying on the stone steps outside her house when the front door was opened very cautiously and quietly for it was not the banker who was leaving the house but a wealthy young officer whom the girl was letting out he kissed the pretty little cerebus as he put a gold coin into her hand and then accidentally trod on the idealist who was lying outside they all three simultaneously uttered a cry the girl blew out the candle the officer instinctively half drew his sword and the student ran away ever since that night the poor crazy fellow went about with a dagger which he concealed in his belt and it was his constant companion to the theatre and the stage door when the actress's carriage used to wait for her and to her house where he nightly kept his painful watch his first idea was to kill his fortunate rival then himself then the theatrical princess 
but at last he lay down again outside her door or stood on the pavement and watched the shadows that flitted hither and thither on her window turned by the magic spell of the lovely actress and then the most incredible thing happened something which he could never have hoped for and which he scarcely believed when it did occur one evening when she had been playing a very important part she kept the carriage waiting much longer than usual but at last she appeared and got into it she did not shut the door however but beckoned to the young idealist to follow her he was almost delirious with joy just as a moment before he had been almost mad with despair and obeyed her immediately and during the drive he lay at her feet and covered her hands with kisses she allowed it quietly and even merrily and when the carriage stopped at her door she let him lift her out of the carriage and went upstairs leaning on his arm there the lady's maid showed him into a luxuriously furnished drawing-room while the actress changed her dress presently she appeared in her dressing-gown sat down carelessly in an easy chair and asked him to sit down beside her you take a great interest in me she said you are my ideal the student cried enthusiastically the theatrical princess smiled and said well i will at any rate be an honest ideal i will not deceive you and you shall not be able to say that i have misused your youthful enthusiasm i will give myself to you oh heavens the poor idealist exclaimed throwing himself at her feet wait a moment wait a moment she said with a smile i have not finished yet i can only love a man who is in a position to provide me with all those luxuries which an actress or if you like which i cannot do without as far as i know you are poor but i will belong to you only for tonight however and in return you must promise me not to rave about me or to follow me from tonight will you do this the wretched idealist was kneeling before her he was having a terrible mental struggle will you promise me to do this she said again yes he said almost groaning the next morning a man who had buried his ideal tottered downstairs he was pale enough almost as pale as a corpse but in spite of this he is still alive and if he has any ideal at all at present it is certainly not a theatrical princess End of section 9. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 10 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant. Volume 3. By Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Stable Perfume three ladies belonging to that class of society which has nothing useful to do and therefore does not know how to employ its time sensibly were sitting on a bench in the shade of some pine trees at ischel and were talking incidentally of their preference for all sorts of smells one of the ladies princess f a slim handsome brunette declared there was nothing like the smell of russian leather she wore dull brown russian leather boots a russian leather dress suspender to keep her petticoats out of the dirt and dust a russian leather belt which spanned her wasp-like waist carried a russian leather purse and even wore a brooch and bracelet of gilt russian leather people declared that her bedroom was prepared with russian leather and that her lover was obliged to wear high russian leather boots and tight breeches but that on the other hand her husband was excused from wearing anything at all in russian leather countess h a very stout lady who had formerly been very beautiful and of a very loving nature but loving after the fashion of her time a la parthenia and griseldis could not get over the vulgar taste of the young princess all she cared for was the smell of hay and she it was who brought the scent new mown hay into fashion her ideal was a freshly mown field in the moonlight 
and when she rolled slowly along she looked like a moving haystack and exhaled an odor of hay all about her the third lady's taste was even more peculiar than countess h s and more vulgar than the princess's for the small delicate light-haired countess w lived only for the smell of stables her friends could absolutely not understand this the princess raised her beautiful full arm with its broad bracelet to her grecian nose and inhaled the sweet smell of the russian leather while the sentimental hayrick exclaimed over and over again how dreadful what dost thou say to it chaste moon the delicate little countess seemed very much embarrassed at the effect that her confession had had and tried to justify her taste prince t told me that that smell had quite bewitched him once she said it was in a jewish town in galicia where he was quartered once with his hussar regiment and a number of poor ragged circus riders with half-starved horses came from russia and put up a circus with a few poles and some rags of canvas and the prince went to see them and found a woman among them who was neither young nor beautiful but bold and impudent and the impudent woman wore a faded bright red jacket trimmed with old shabby imitation ermine and that jacket stank of the stable as the prince expressed it and she bewitched him with that odor so that every time that the shameless wretch lay in his arms and laughed impudently and smelled abominably of the stable he felt as if he were magnetized how disgusting both the other ladies said and involuntarily held their noses what dost thou say to it chaste moon the haystick said with a sigh and the little light-haired countess was abashed and held her tongue at the beginning of the winter season the three friends were together again in the gay imperial city on the blue danube one morning the princess accidentally met the enthusiast for the hay at the house of the little light-haired countess and the two ladies were obliged to go after her to her private riding school where she was taking her daily lesson as soon as she saw them she came up and beckoned her riding master to her to help her out of the saddle he was a young man of extremely good and athletic build which was set off by his tight breeches and his short velvet coat and he ran up and took his lovely burden into his arms with visible pleasure to help her off the quiet perfectly broken horse when the ladies looked at the handsome vigorous man it was quite enough to explain their little friend's predilection for the smell of a stable but when the latter saw their looks she blushed up to the roots of her hair and her only way out of the difficulty was to order the riding master in a very authoritative manner to take the horse back to the stable he merely bowed with an indescribable smile and obeyed her a few months afterwards viennese society was alarmed at the news that countess w had been divorced from her husband the event was all the more unexpected as they had apparently always lived very happily together and nobody was able to mention any man on whom she had bestowed even the most passing attention beyond the requirements of politeness long afterwards however a strange report became current a chattering lady's maid declared that the handsome riding-master had once so far forgotten himself as to strike the countess with his riding-whip a groom had told the count of the occurrence and when he was going to call the insolent fellow to account for it the countess covered him with her own body and thus gave occasion for the divorce years had passed since then and the countess h had grown stouter and more sentimental Ischel and Hayrix were not enough for her any longer. She spent the winter on lovely Lago Maggiore, where she walked among laurel bushes and cypress trees and was rowed about on the lukewarm moonlight nights. One evening she was returning home in the company of an English lady, who was also a great lover of nature, from Isola Bella, when they met a beautiful private boat in which a very unusual couple were sitting a small delicate light-haired woman wrapped in a white burnous and a handsome athletic man in tight white breeches a short black velvet coat trimmed with sable 
a red fez on his head, and a riding whip in his hand. Countess K. involuntarily uttered a loud exclamation. "'What is the matter with you?' the English lady asked. "'Do you know those people?' "'Certainly. She is a Viennese lady,' Countess H. whispered. "'Countess W.' "'Oh, indeed, you are quite mistaken. It is a Count Savelli and his wife. They are a handsome couple, don't you think?' When the boat came nearer, she saw that in spite of that it was little Countess W., and that the handsome man was her former riding-master, whom she had married, and for whom she had bought a title from the Pope. And as the two boats passed each other, the short sable cloak which was thrown carelessly over his shoulders exhaled, like the old catskin jacket of that impudent female circus rider, a strong stable perfume. End of section 10. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 11 of the Works of Guy de Maupassant, Volume 3, by Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Ill-Omened Groom. An Impudent Theft to a very large amount, had been committed in the capital. Jewels, a valuable watch set with diamonds, his wife's miniature in a frame encased with brilliance, and a considerable sum in money, the whole amounting in value to a hundred and fifteen thousand florins, had been stolen. The banker himself went to the director of police to give notice of the robberies but at the same time he begged as a special favor that the investigation might be carried on as quietly and considerately as possible, as he declared that he had not the slightest ground for suspecting anybody in particular, and did not wish any innocent person to be accused. First of all, give me the names of all the persons who regularly go into your bedroom, the police director said. Nobody, except my wife, my children, and Joseph, my valet, a man for whom I would answer as I would for myself. Then you think him absolutely incapable of committing such a deed? Most decidedly I do, the banker replied. Very well. Then can you remember whether on the day on which you first missed the articles that have been stolen, or on any days immediately preceding it, anybody who was not a member of your household happened by chance to go to your bedroom? The banker thought for a moment, and then said, with some hesitation, Nobody. Absolutely nobody. The experienced official, however, was struck by the banker's slight embarrassment and momentary blush. So he took his hand, and looking him straight in the face, he said, You are not quite candid with me. Somebody was with you, and you wish to conceal the fact from me. You must tell me everything. No, no, indeed there was nobody here. Then, at present, there is only one person on whom any suspicion can rest, and that is your valet. I will vouch for his honesty, the banker replied immediately. You may be mistaken, and I shall be obliged to question the man. May I beg you to do it with every possible consideration? You may rely upon me for that. An hour later the banker's valet was in the police director's private room, who first of all looked at his man very closely, and then came to the conclusion that such an honest, unembarrassed face and such quiet, steady eyes could not possibly belong to a criminal. Do you know why I have sent for you? No, Your Honor. A large theft has been committed in your master's house, the police director continued, from his bedroom. Do you suspect anybody? Who has been into the room within the last few days? Nobody but myself, except my master's family. Do you not see, my good fellow, that by saying that you throw suspicion on yourself? Surely, sir, the valet exclaimed, you do not believe. I must not believe anything. My duty is merely to investigate and to follow up any traces that I may discover, was the reply. If you have been the only person to go into the room within the last few days, I must hold you responsible. My master knows me. 
the police director shrugged his shoulders your master has vouched for your honesty but that is not enough for me you are the only person on whom at present any suspicion rests and therefore i must sorry as i am to do so have you arrested if that is so the man said after some hesitation i prefer to speak the truth for my good name is more to me than my situation somebody was in my master's apartments yesterday and this somebody was a lady a lady of his acquaintance the valet did not reply for some time it must come out he said at length my master keeps a woman you understand sir a pretty fair woman and he has furnished a house for her and goes to see her but secretly of course for if my mistress were to find it out there would be a terrible scene this person was with him yesterday were they alone i showed her in and she was in his bedroom with him but i had to call him out after a short time as his confidential clerk wanted to speak to him and so she was in the room alone for about a quarter of an hour what is her name cecilia k she is a hungarian at the same time the valet gave him her address then the director of police sent for the banker who on being brought face to face with his valet was obliged to acknowledge the truth of the facts which the latter had alleged painful as it was for him to do so whereupon orders were given to take cecilia k into custody in less than half an hour however the police officer who had been dispatched for that purpose returned and said that she had left her apartments and most likely the capital also the previous evening the unfortunate banker was almost in despair not only had he been robbed of a hundred and fifty thousand florins but at the same time he had lost the beautiful woman whom he loved with all the passion of which he was capable he could not grasp the idea that a woman whom he had surrounded with asiatic luxury whose strangest whims he had gratified and whose tyranny he had borne so patiently could have deceived him so shamefully and now he had a quarrel with his wife and an end of all domestic peace into the bargain the only thing the police could do was to raise the hue and cry after the lady who had denounced herself by her flight but it was all of no use in vain did the banker in whose heart hatred and thirst for revenge had taken the place of love implore the director of police to employ every means to bring the beautiful criminal to justice and in vain did he undertake to be responsible for all the costs of her prosecution no matter how heavy they might be special police officers were told off to try and discover her but cecilia k was so rude as not to allow herself to be caught three years had passed and the unpleasant story appeared to have been forgotten the banker had obtained his wife's pardon and what he cared about a good deal more he had found another charming mistress and the police did not appear to trouble themselves about the beautiful hungarian any more we must now change the scene to london a wealthy lady who created much sensation in society and who made many conquests both by her beauty and her free behavior was in want of a groom among the many applicants for the situation there was a young man whose good looks and manners gave people the impression that he must have been very well educated this was a recommendation in the eyes of the lady's maid and she took him immediately to her mistress's boudoir when he entered he saw a beautiful voluptuous-looking woman at most twenty-five years of age with large bright eyes and blue-black hair which seemed to increase the brilliancy of her fair complexion lying on a sofa she looked at the young man who also had thick black hair and who turned his glowing black eyes to the ground beneath her searching gaze with evident satisfaction and she seemed particularly taken with his slender athletic build and then she said half lazily and half proudly what is your name lajos mariasi a hungarian and there was a strange look in her eyes yes how did you come here i am one of the many immigrants who have forfeited their country and their life and I, who come of a good family and who was an officer of the Honveds, must now go into service. 
and thank god if i find a mistress who is at the same time beautiful and an aristocrat as you are miss zoe that was the lovely woman's name smiled and at the same time showed two rows of pearly teeth i like your looks she said and i feel inclined to take you into my service if you are satisfied with my terms a lady's whim her maid said to herself when she noticed the ardent looks which miss zoe gave her manservant which will soon pass away but that experienced female was mistaken that time zoe was really in love and the respect with which lajos treated her put her into a very bad temper one evening when she intended to go to the italian opera she countermanded her carriage and refused to see her noble adorer who wished to throw himself at her feet and ordered her groom to be sent up to her boudoir lajos she began i am not at all satisfied with you why madame i do not wish to have you about me any longer here are your wages for three months leave the house immediately and she began to walk up and down the room impatiently i will obey you madame the groom replied but i shall not take my wages why not she asked hastily because then i should be under your authority for three months lajos said and i intend to be free this very moment so that i may be able to tell you that i entered your service not for the sake of your money but because i love and adore a beautiful woman in you you love me zoe exclaimed why did you not tell me sooner i merely wished to banish you from my presence because i love you and did not think that you loved me but you shall smart for having tormented me so come to my feet immediately the groom knelt before the lovely girl whose moist lips sought his at the same instant from that moment lajos became her favorite of course he was not allowed to be jealous as the young lord was still her official lover who had the pleasure of paying everything for that licentious beauty and besides him there was a whole army of so-called good friends who were fortunate enough to obtain a smile now and then and occasionally something more and who in return had permission to present her with rare flowers a parrot or diamonds the more intimate zoe became with lajos the more uncomfortable she felt when he looked at her as he frequently did with undisguised contempt she was wholly under his influence and was afraid of him and one day while he was playing with her dark curls he said jeeringly it is usually said that contrasts usually attract each other and yet you are as dark as i am she smiled and then tore off her black curls and immediately the most charming fair-haired woman was sitting by the side of lajos who looked at her attentively but without any surprise he left his mistress at about midnight in order to look after the horses as he said and she put on a very pretty nightdress and went to bed she remained awake for fully an hour expecting her lover and then she went to sleep but in two hours time she was roused from her slumbers and saw a police inspector and two constables by the side of her magnificent bed whom do you want she cried cecilia k i am miss zoe oh i know you the inspector said with a smile be kind enough to take off your dark locks and you will be cecilia k i arrest you in the name of the law good heavens she stammered lajos has betrayed me you are mistaken madame the inspector replied he has merely done his duty what lajos my lover no lajos the detective cecilia got out of bed and the next moment she sank fainting onto the floor end of section 11 recording by james k white chula vista